All right, good morning, everyone. I think our next guest really doesn't need an introduction. We are going to be hearing from the serial entrepreneur behind a range of companies, PayPal, Tesla Motors, Solar City, SpaceX. He is a titan of industry who has disrupted and transformed entire industries. And we're talking about automotive, aerospace, energy, internet finance. And these are sectors that are really tough to operate in as a startup. Um, in the next 40 minutes, we are going to hear from Elon Musk, and we're going to learn more about Tesla Motors in Hong Kong, in China. We're going to hear about sustainable energy solutions. We're going to talk about Mars, and we're also going to touch on the fate and future of humankind. Pretty big stuff. So on this icy cold day here in Hong Kong, let's give a very warm welcome to Elon Musk. You can pick any mic on the table. There's so many to choose from. Okay. <laughs> Invest <Is> HK. <laughs> All right. Elon Musk, welcome to Hong Kong. Um, I talked to your people at Tesla here in Hong Kong, and you know Tesla opened up here in 2010. Um, the Model S has been selling pretty well, good buildup. First general question, how's the business doing here in Hong Kong? Um, actually, I mean, at Tesla, we're, we're super appreciative of, uh, of Hong Kong. Um, it's uh, it's the... the, the um, uh, the, the city w with the, I believe at this point, the most number of Teslas per capita. Yeah. Um, so so the, the um, and um, I think, I think it's, it's sort of a, it's a very exciting, I think, model in Hong Kong because I think Hong Kong will have over time the highest percentage of electric vehicles of any city in the world um, and can therefore serve as a model uh, for how other um, high-density cities around the world can transform to a sustainable transport future. So I think, um, I think that's, that's very exciting. So we plan to work closely with the, the Hong Kong government um, and to take lessons learned and see what we can do to then propagate that to cities around the world. So um, we're, we're very excited about the partnership with, with Hong Kong. Yeah, and because Hong Kong is such a densely packed city, there's no range anxiety in Hong Kong, but that's not the only factor behind the popularity of the Tesla. What are the other factors? Um, sure. Well, I think certainly uh, the, you know, the, the range not being an issue is, is, is one factor, uh, although that is counterbalanced by uh, challenges with charging. Yeah. Um, so one of the, uh, the things that we need to work through, and this is a, a challenge that, that um, any other uh, dense city in the world has, is um, as you have more and more electric vehicles on the roads, you have to find some place to, to charge them. And the ideal place to charge the car is at uh, your home or, or office, essentially the same place that you uh, charge your phone. Um, but, th but this is challenging because a lot of apartment buildings, well, most apartment buildings didn't anticipate um, having that level of power in the garage. Um, and sometimes the parking spot spots float around, they're not consistent. So it's going to be quite important to um, get, get the power to the buildings that need it, mm. um, and then and figure out a, a good and convenient way for people to charge at home. Um, we are deploying a lot of superchargers, and of course that's that's going to be important. But it, th those are really meant for when you're um, ha have an unusually long trip, um, and you've been away from your home or office for a while, um, or, or you need to top up and you're out and about. Um, but by far the most convenient is home or office charging, and that's the mm. thing that we're really working closely with the uh, Hong Kong government on. Yeah. Hey, we were talking about this earlier, about the impact of falling oil prices, because high oil prices was a major selling point for getting into hybrids or electric vehicles. Right. Now that oil prices are in free fall, what does that mean for the industry? Well, it, it definitely makes the transition to sustainable energy more difficult. Yeah. Um, and I think no, no doubt that that is going to uh, dampen interest in electric vehicles in general. Um, with, with our cars, what, we're, what, we're, what we aspire to do is to make the car so compelling um, that uh, even with low gasoline prices, it's still the car you want to buy. Yeah. Um, I, that's, I mean, the only thing I can think of, to, yeah. to, that's the only sort of... Well, that's what else we could do, really. You have to yeah. make it compelling. So, yes, exactly. and, and this is really at the key of Tesla, is to create an electric car that's not worthy, it's going to help the environment, but 
it is a car that you will covet, that you want to drive, that yeah. happens to be very good for the climate change or very good, very good for um, the environment. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is sort of general, um, you know, ad advice I'd give to people starting companies, to entrepreneurs in general, is um, r really focus on making a product that your customers love. Um, and it, it's so rare that you can buy a product and, and you love the product when you, when you bought it. The, this is, this is, there are very few uh, things that fit into that category. And if you, if you can come up with something like that, your, your business will be successful for sure. Um, let's talk about China. Um, China is the world's largest auto market. Um, China is also, it's a growing electric vehicle market too. It's soon to be the world's largest there. Um, world's largest carbon emitter. We've seen the return of the so-called air apocalypse and crazy bad air days in places like Shenyang and Beijing, especially during the winter time. Um, China needs your technology. Is China really aware of that? Do you get that sense? Um, and if you don't mind, if you could hold the mic a little bit it's, closer. Sorry, yeah, that, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I see it's very high gain. Um, look, okay. Um, um, yes, uh, China is definitely aware of, of Tesla. I've had a number of uh, high-level meetings with uh, the Chinese government. Um, and in fact, um, the, the Minister of Finance uh, recently mentioned Tesla in a speech that he gave. Oh, wow. Um, as, as a good example, yeah. actually. He, he's, so he's, he's, um, he likes what we're doing. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, um, and, then, and then last year, we, uh, in, in, in an effort to help the rest of industry and just sort of um, kind of be, be a good, good neighbor, we uh, open sourced all of our patents. Um, so any company in China or elsewhere can use uh, our patents to uh, create electric vehicles. Oh, wow. Um, so. wow. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing there just really underscores a theme that emerged at the latest um, climate change conference in Paris, the debate on whether developed countries should be doing more to help developing countries when the goal is Absolutely. a general shared goal. And you're saying a, a, a company from a developed country should be doing that little bit more in a market like China. Uh, I, I agree, although quite frankly, I think China is quite, quite well it's developed. It's quite developed, I mean, yeah. You know, <laughs> like, let me tell you, China has better highways and, and definitely better trains than the United States. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> By far, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, in fact, I had a great experience taking the, the bullet train from Beijing to Xi'an to see the Terracotta oh, Warriors. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that was, it was an, a great experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, so, I, I think uh, th th there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunity there. I think um, the, the, the challenge for Tesla is that um, w if in, in China, we, we need to establish sort of a local partnership. Yeah. Um, and so, we're going to kind of figure that out. Um, um, w there is the issue of pollution in China, the need for sustainable energy solutions in China. Gridlock is a huge issue in places like Beijing. I don't know if you've been stuck in Beijing traffic. I've been yeah. stuck in Beijing. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. we've all, everyone here who's yeah. traveled to China, you're stuck in, it's pretty mm -hmm. crazy. Can Tesla Autopilot provide some sort of a solution to that? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I think I think autopilot can certainly take the edge off, um, <laughs> um, because the, 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 um, our autopilot capability right now is really good um, in in two scenarios. Um, it, we're either we're on a on a highway where there's no traffic and the lines are are, are, are quite clear, yeah. um, or or in heavy traffic. So it's super good in heavy traffic. Uh, not, not that I'd recommend it, but you know you can read a book or do email. That's <laughs> what I found. Um, I've heard people say. Um, <laughs> so, the, the, uh, so, so you can really take the edge off the traffic, but um, I, I'm actually quite a big fan of tunnels. Um, uh, tunnels are so underappreciated. Uh, uh, please, <laughs> please elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, the, the fundamental problem with cities is that w we build cities in 3D. Yeah. I mean, you see you've got these tall buildings with lots of people on each floor, um, but then you've got roads which are 2D. Yeah. Um, so that, that obviously just doesn't work. Um, you're, you're guaranteed to have gridlock. Um, but you can go 3D if you have tunnels. Mm. Um, and you can have many tunnels crisscrossing each other with maybe a few meters vertical distance between them mm. um, and, and, and completely get rid of traffic problems. Mm. Um, and it's my understanding that actually Hong Kong is in the process of building uh, some tunnels. Mm. And I was very pleased to hear that. Um, 
but, but that, that really is the solution um, for solving traffic in major cities. Yeah, you, you can also go 3D with flying cars. You can. <laughs> but yeah. that's not gonna happen for a long time. Well, I mean, flying cars um, sound cool, but then uh, they do make a lot of wind, yeah. and um. they're kind of noisy, and- You've sought this out. <laughs> the probability of something falling on your head is much higher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha. We talked about charging stations and the challenge for rolling out more charging stations in Hong Kong. The challenge is exponentially greater in China, especially in the rural areas to connect the big cities. Um, what, what are your plans on, on that? So we actually have a supercharging network uh, yeah. uh, throughout China. You can go, um, at this point, almost anywhere in, in China yeah. um, uh, using the Tesla supercharger network. And then we've got, um, so, uh, there's a whole bunch of third party uh, affiliate destination chargers. And we've actually had people drive uh, all the way from uh, Beijing to Tibet. Yeah. So it's a, uh, wow. yeah, in a, in a Model S. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Have you driven a Tesla in rural China? Um, no. No, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> other people have. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Model 3. Um, what can you tell us about the Model 3, what it's going to look like? And I know that y y you've mentioned to me about, <laughs> it, sorry. No, no, sorry, I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah I, can't, I can't tell you what it's gonna look like. Okay, but, okay. Um, but I, I mean, I can tell you just generally some characteristics about it, which is it's meant to be um, a slightly smaller version, um, uh, it's a, it's sort of a smaller version of the Model S, yeah. um, and it won't have quite as many bells and whistles, but it'll be um, at a much lower price point. Yep. Um, so the intent is to, uh, uh, roughly get the, cut the price in half uh, for, uh, for a smaller vehicle and, um, and, and I think really that's gonna be uh, probably the most um, profound, profound car that we, we make because that, that'll, that, that'll be, a, I think, a very compelling car at an affordable price. Yeah, the, this yeah. is, with the Model 3, the electric vehicle could go fully mainstream. Yeah. Um, other um, car manufacturers, we have GM in mind with the Bolt doing the same thing and you welcome your rivals doing this. Right, yeah, yeah. The, the, the goal of Tesla from the beginning has been to accelerate the advent of sustainable transport. So mm -hmm. um, we, we, uh, we actually did some partnerships. We did one with uh, Mercedes and one with uh, Toyota um, and um, you know, open source IP and everything. So um, the, the whole purpose of, of it was really to accelerate the advent of sustainable transport. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, it's always great to hear when other car companies are making electric cars. Yeah, including car companies inside China. Yeah, um, absolutely. Are there any Chinese electric car vehicle uh, makers that, that are capturing your attention or? Uh, well, we, we don't think too much about uh, what, what competitors are doing. Yeah. Um, just w because I think it's important to um, be just focused on making the best possible uh, products. Um, you know, it's sort of maybe analogous to what they say about you know, if you're in a in a if you if you're in a in a race, yeah. um, it's a, don't worry about what how the other what the other runners are doing. Yeah. Just run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, to to push that metaphor even more, are you afraid that whoever's hosting the race could tilt the race in favor of <laughs> the Chinese racer? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out if there's any way to answer that question and not lose. Um. <laughs> you, you get one pass <laughs> okay, during you. this interview. If you'd like to take the pass, okay. you could take I'll, that I'll pass. Pass with that one. Okay. <laughs> um, we, we've talked about innovation in China, and I, I thought your answer was really interesting. And it'd be cool to share it with the audience here. Um, what was, what is the example of made in China innovation that you thought, wow, that's pretty cool? Uh, well, I think actually um, a lot of the, the social media uh, services in China, um, uh, you know, Weibo, WeChat, uh, pr pretty impressive, I think better than what is available in the US. Yeah. Um, Are you on WeChat? I am actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you know, I only use WeChat when I'm in mainland China on business. Yeah. Do you use WeChat in LA and Silicon Valley? Um, occasionally to correspond with people in China. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. See, that's it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's, it's pretty good. Um, uh, which, um, what, what, I think Alibaba is pretty impressive as well. Alibaba is pretty, do you use Alibaba? Have you uh, no. used? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you purchased. But I've heard impressive <laughs> things about it. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. very, very impressive. Yeah. yeah. Um, WeChat, how do you use it? Which messaging functions do you like to use on it? Well, I, I wouldn't call, call myself sort of a, a, a WeChat expert. Yeah. Um, I, I basically just message people. Yeah. And, and <laughs> <laughs> Got Send it. pictures, okay. pictures and text. Got it. Can now, you do other things? <laughs> um. now, now, recently, um, I, I did a panel discussion in Beijing with a group of technologists, and the subject came up, um, or, or I brought up the question, can there be an Elon Musk in China? And the answer was no. And it was because of, and this is according to Kai-Fu Lee, uh, former head of Google China, who started Microsoft Research, um, in Beijing, and he said it's because of the education system in China. It, it emphasizes too much rote learning. You are Elon Musk. Um, do you? Wh what do you make of that? I mean, do you do you agree with that? Well, I, I actually, um, I mean, obviously, are a number of very successful uh, entrepreneurs in China. Yeah, Jack Ma, Pony Ma. That's yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I think uh, I'm not sure I would entirely agree with that. Yeah. Um, but, but but it is generally true that. Um, you know, innovation comes from questioning the way things have been done before. Yeah. Um, and if in the education system you're, you're taught not to do that, that will mm -hmm. inhibit uh, entrepreneurship. Being able to question what you're being taught. Being able to... Yeah. I yeah. mean, just, uh, you know, saying, well, is there a better way? Yeah. Um, you know, to ask that question. Yeah. Um, let's talk about innovation at Tesla. A few more questions there. Um, so we, we talked about Tesla Autopilot. There's also Tesla Summon, and I love that name, the Summon, <laughs> where right. you summon the Tesla with your uh, mobile phone. Um, and you know, we, we did talk about this earlier. I, I know that the, there's a big gap between those two programs and self-driving cars, but is Tesla on its way to a driverless model? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the whole industry ultimately will be producing autonomous cars. And if you went, if you fast forward, let's say 10 or, or certainly not more than 15 years, I think almost all cars produced will be autonomous. All cars produced will be autonomous. All new cars, yes. But that's not the same as all cars on the road, because yeah. um, th th there's roughly two billion cars and trucks on the road, yeah. um, and uh, just under 100 million produced every year. Um, so it's. So the production rate is only 5% of the, of the fleet size. Yeah. Um, but if you say of new cars produced, um, I'd be surprised if a majority of them are not self-driving in, let's say, 10 to 15 years. And of all those uh, new self-driving cars out on the road, how many of them will have, you know, it's like a, um, it will have a steering wheel versus not having a steering wheel? It's like the... <laughs> You know, just a remnant of the past, right? Sure. Uh, the steering wheel thing, I'm not sure about. I mean, there may be some, perhaps, um, auxiliary steering wheel yeah. that um, only pops out when, you know, when they, you need to take manual control for whatever reason. Um, but probably if you go long, long term, my guess is there, there isn't a, a steering wheel in most cars. It would be something that you would have to special order or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> In, in most cars, not all cars. And I, I, I do want to be clear, like, uh, the, the pr pr predictions are not endorsements. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it's, I'm not saying that this would be a good or a bad thing. Yeah. I'm just saying that this is probably what will occur. This is pattern recognition and anticipating what's going to happen next. It's, it's likely. I mean, I mean, I think it's sort of like elevators used to have a manual elevator operator. Yep. And you'd have somebody would be sort of moving the lever and be able to do fine tune adjustments yep. um, with the elevator for each floor. Um, now there's no manual controller for, for elevators. Yeah. I think it, it's going to seem the same way for cars. Yeah. And how about the way consumers interact with driverless cars? How many consumers will choose to own their own car versus signing into a networked fleet of driverless cars? I think probably still most people will own their own car. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 there will be... A, I, it's hard to predict the exact percentage, but um, I mean, I, I think probably roughly 
60, 70 percent of people will probably want to own their cars, and um, we'll call it two thirds own, one third share. Uh, uh, this is a complete, uh, <laughs> you know, shooting in the dark guess, but yeah. um, I, I think still most people will want to own their own car. Yeah. Um, but they also may, may choose to um, add it to the shared fleet and then take it out of the shared fleet at will. Yeah, and you don't see that as a threat to your business model. Um, no, I think just as long as we make uh, great autonomous cars. Um, yeah. It's just uh, additional options for the consumer. Yeah, it, it's just ad adding functionality that I think people will consider quite important in a car in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I've, I've said this before, but I think it, it, in the long term, owning a car that does not have auton autonomous capability will be like a bit like owning a horse. Yeah. I mean, you sort of own a horse for sentimental reasons. Um, but not, uh. but you know, but not, yeah. not, not for actual transport. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the futuristic-looking Model X. And a question that many Hong Kongers have is, can I park this thing in my parking garage? Because of those Falcon wing doors. Mm -hmm. um, what's your answer to that? Um, yeah, actually, the Falcon wing doors um, are double hinged. Yeah. Um, so we should call them Falcon wing instead of gull wing. Um, because they have a, a dual acting hinge, so they're actually they can open open in a tighter space than almost any door, and yeah. certainly more than a conventional a tighter space than a conventional door. If you can physically fit between your car and a Model X, then you'll be able to get in the Falcon Wing door. Yeah, and it looks beautiful, and I love the. I, I mentioned this again when we talked yesterday. I, I love the Back to the Future series. It reminds me of the DeLorean, which I know I should not compare Tesla <laughs> to. Um, you know, it looks sci-fi, it looks cool, but it also, and this is important, it serves a design purpose. What is that purpose? Um, yeah, so the Falcon Wing door is designed to um, Im improve accessibility of the third row. I mean, typically in a three-row a three row car in an SUV, it's quite difficult to access the third row uh, directly. Um, you have to fold up the second row seat, uh, and it, you really somehow have to move the seat back uh, of the second row, uh, which if you've got sort of a child or child seat in the second row can make it really inconvenient to access the third row. So by having the Falcon Wing door, we have a much bigger opening that allows you to directly step to the third row um, quite conveniently, um, even if, 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 the, there's, if there are baby seats in the second row. Um, and then um, if you're a mother, um, put, putting your child in the child seat in the second row is very easy. Um, because the, 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 you have such a big opening, yeah. um, and you can you can step into the car and put the child into the child seat instead of cantilevering um, your child over sort of the, the you know through a hole over the baby seat um, uh, sort of armrests. So it's meant to to improve accessibility, and there are really only two ways to to achieve that level of accessibility. One is the is, is the sliding door of a minivan, and the other is to have something like the Falcon Wing door. Mm. Um, and the reason we didn't go for a sliding door for li like a minivan is that it, it fundamentally constrains the aesthetics of the exterior of the car. Um, and you have to have three support rails, uh, which also negatively affect the aesthetics. And um, that's why all minivans pretty much look the same. Mm. Um, and we, and we, want to, uh, we, so we want to have something was, that had that level of accessibility and actually has greater accessibility than a minivan door, um, but also looks good. This is classic user-centered design. And can I just say thank you for designing for moms? Absolutely. And thank you for designing for parents. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, parents will, will really really enjoy the the, the Model X. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're also taking good fe you know feedback from uh, customers. Um, and uh, for example, one of the things that was asked of some of our Hong Kong customers that have ordered the Model X is. To have a partial a partial open function of the of the Falcon Wing door, so if you're if it's a if it's really heavy rain, oh yeah, um, so it's like an, an umbrella or yeah, so you, you'd want sort of a maybe a 50 60 percent open uh, level, <laughs> um, so you have a good shield from from the rain. Yeah, um, and um, I think people are pleased to know that it actually is already in the works. Oh, very good, yeah. very cool. Just very a software cool. update. And something that is also potentially in the works, but only for a select few, a submersible Tesla. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that'll be n not anytime soon, but um, but uh, yeah, that, that's just sort of to be a fun fun side project to have a submersible Tesla. But, but I think the market for submarine cars is quite small. So. <laughs>
But you don't have to use the uh, Cross Harbor Tunnel in Hong Kong. You could just go through the Victoria Harbor. Uh, yeah, that's true. That'd be pretty epic. You could just drive right off the <laughs> yeah. ramp, right off the edge of the, that's the, right. the, the pier. Be James Bond every day yeah. on your commute. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a Tesla truck, could that ever happen? Um, yeah, I think it's quite likely we'll do a truck in the future. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Any more details on that? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's sort of a logical thing um, for us to do in the future. Okay. Now, with Tesla, your goal has been to make a better car. Mm -hmm. And you've done that with an electric vehicle that people covet, that has quite a cult following, um, that's upgradable. Um, but you also want to achieve, and your turn of phrase is very nice, um, or, or try to achieve this platonic ideal of a car. Right, to reach uh, yeah. perfection. So what does the perfect car look like? Well, I mean, I do, I do use that phrase with our engineering design team that aspirationally um, we're in pursuit of the platonic ideal of the perfect car. Yeah. Um, and um, who knows what that looks like actually, but it's, I, you, you wanna try to make every element of the car um, as, as flawless as possible. Um, and there will always be, you know, some um, degree of imperfection, but um, try to minimize that um, and, and create a car that is just delightful in every way. Um, and I think if you do that, then the, the rest kind of takes care of itself. Okay. Um, you're also the chairman of Solar City, um, building out a, a network of solar panels and solar systems. And I can see why solar can make sense in a place like California, where it's sunny all the time, homes are big, a lot of roof space, you can lay out all the solar panels. But in a place like Hong Kong, you know, densely packed, vertical cities, how can solar make sense here? Yeah, I think um, it, it's true that in dense cities, um, rooftop solar is, is not going to solve the, the energy uh, need. Yeah. Um, but what you can do is have ground mount solar power, let's say uh, near Hong Kong, um, tapping into the existing power lines that, that, are, that are coming in. Um, and uh, so you can supply Hong Kong with solar power, we just need to be coming from um, a land area mm -hmm. um, that's not too far away. Um, and I mean, it's worth noting, certainly, uh, you know, China has actually an enormous land mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. much of which is hardly occupied at all. Mm -hmm. um, with, given that the Chinese population is so concentrated along the coast, mm -hmm. once you go inland, it, the, the population in some cases is remarkably tiny. Mm -hmm. um, so you could easily power all of China uh, with solar. Hmm. All of China with well, solar? Easily, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, easy. The world's most populous country. Yep, definitely. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's go even more way out there and talk about SpaceX. Um, you're the CEO of SpaceX, and you, you've said that your ultimate goal is to get humankind to Mars. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've heard your response to the question, but these guys need to hear it. Why is Mars important? Why does Mars matter? Sure, well, I think the, it's, it's really a fundamental decision we need to make um, as a civilization. Uh, you know, what, what kind of future do we want? Do we want a future where we are forever confined to one planet until some eventual extinction event, however far in the future that might occur? Um, or do we want to become a multi-planet species um, and, and then ultimately be out there among the stars and be among many planets, many star systems? And I think the latter is a far more exciting and inspiring future than the former. Um, and, and Mars is the next uh, natural step. Um, in fact, it's the only planet we really have a shot at, at establishing a self-sustaining city on. Um, and, uh, and I think once we do establish such a city, there will be a strong forcing function for the improvement of spaceflight technology that will then enable us to uh, establish colonies elsewhere in the solar system and ultimately extend beyond, the, beyond our solar system. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so there's the defensive reason of uh, protecting the future of humanity, ensuring that the light of consciousness is not extinguished uh, should some calamity befall Earth. Uh, but also, and, and that, that's the defensive reason, but personally I find the more, the, what, what um, gets me more excited is, is the fact that this would be an incredible adventure. Mm. I mean, it'd be like the greatest adventure ever. Mm. Mm. Um, and it would be exciting and inspiring. And there need to be things that excite and inspire people. Yeah. There have to be you know, reasons why you get up in the morning. It can't just be solving problems. It's gotta be, 
yeah, something something great is going to happen in the future. Yeah, we talked about this at length yesterday. It's it's not an exit strategy or a backup plan right. for humankind <laughs> no. when Earth fails. Right. It's also to inspire people on Earth, yeah. right, and to transcend and to think to go beyond our. Um, mental limits of what we think we can achieve. Right, I mean, you think of sort of how incredible the Apollo program was, and just, yeah. I mean, if, if you ask anyone and say, name, name some of humanity's greatest achievements of yeah. the 20th century, the, the Apollo program landing on the moon would, would make, in many if not most places, be number one. When will there be a manned SpaceX mission, and when will you go to Mars? <laughs> well, we're pretty close to, to do it, to, to uh, sending crew up uh, to the space station. That's currently yeah. scheduled for the end of next year. Yeah. Um, so that'll be that'll be exciting uh, with our Dra uh, Dragon 2 spacecraft. And then um, uh, we'll have a next generation uh, rocket and, and, and spacecraft um, beyond the Falcon Dragon series. Uh, and I'm hoping to uh, describe the that, that architecture um, later this year uh, at the International Astronautical Congress, uh, which is like the, the big international space uh, event every year. Um, so th I think that, that'll be quite exciting. Yeah. And, um, and, and in terms of me going, I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe four or five years from now, maybe going to the space station would be nice. Oh, wow. Um, and, um, and then in terms of the first uh, flights to Mars, and we're hoping to do that in, the, in around 2025. I'm sorry, in 2020, the year 2025. Like sort of nine, nine years from now, thereabouts. Oh my goodness, that's just around the corner. Well, nine years. Um, are you... <laughs> so are... like a long time to me. Are you, are you doing zero gravity training? I, I've, I've done the parabolic flights. Yeah, um, okay. Those are quite fun. And, uh, but you must be reading up and doing the physical uh, testing to, to get ready for this, the ultimate flight of your life. Um, I don't think it's that hard, honestly. I mean, I'm just, <laughs> just float around. You know. It's not that hard but to I float around. But I know you've seen The Martian. We've talked about The Martian. And it yeah, looks well, like the <laughs> hardest thing anyone could ever do is uh, there's getting there and also surviving and trying to anticipate everything that could go wrong and uh, make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, you can tell I'm not going to be signing up for your manned space flights when they take place. Uh, well, I do think, I mean, going to Mars is definitely going to be um, it's going to be hard and, and dangerous and, you know, difficult in, in probably every, every way you can imagine. But um, so it certainly wouldn't be, you know, if, if, you're, if, 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 you, if you care about sort of being safe and comfortable, going to Mars would, would be a terrible choice. Yeah, and, um, and, this, and this is at the heart of, of who you are because you, to quote Pink Floyd, you do not like to live a comfortably numb life. You know, you take on incredible risk to take on in, entrenched, big, established industries and to shake and rattle them up and to introduce something new. And it's, it's so cool to watch. And I think that's why everybody here has signed up to come here and to listen to you, just to hear more about that. Um, people want to be more like you. Really? I, so, <laughs> and you know what, for the fate of humankind, I think it would be great to have more Elon Musks. So what do we need to do to become more like Elon? I uh, I don't know if it's, I think it maybe sounds better than it is. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, uh, I, I mean, honestly, <laughs> like, like th there's a friend of mine who's got a great saying about creating a company, um, which is uh, creating, try, trying to build a company and have it succeed is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. Um, <laughs> well, so, I mean, what tends to happen is it's sort of quite exciting for the first several months yeah. of, of starting a company, yeah. and then then reality sets in. Things don't go as well as planned. Yeah. Customers aren't signing up. The technology or the product isn't working as well as you thought. Yeah. Um, and um, and then can, that can sometimes be compounded by a recession, um, and uh, it can be very, very painful for several years. Um, so I think, um, frankly, starting a company, you, you, I would advise people to have a high pain tolerance. Yeah, yeah. And thanks for reminding us of the harsh, very harsh and brutal reality of launching a startup. 
um, you know, there is that Elon Musk slash Tony Stark mystique. You know, people think, you know, you are, uh, Robert Downey Jr. modeled his character, Tony Stark Iron Man on you. It's, it's easy, it's fun. You're uh, a, a superhero titan of industry, but it's really hard. It's, it's really difficult. And it's something that requires perseverance and grit. Um, do you fear that maybe in, in this generation or the, the younger generation that they don't have that perseverance and grit to, to take on these really tough challenges? I think some people do. Yeah. Um, and, um, but, but no, I, th I think it, it, it is definitely true that, I mean, maybe there are occasionally companies that get created where, where you, there's not an extended period of extreme pain. Um, but, but I'm not aware of, you know, very many such instances. Yeah. Um, and um, so, but I, I do think that, uh, the, the, you know, new great entrepreneurs are, are born ev every day. Yeah. Um, and we'll continue to see amazing companies get built. Um, so, um, yeah, but I, but I, I would uh, definitely advise people who are starting a company to expect a, a, a long period of quite high difficulty. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, as long as uh, people stay super focused on creating the absolute best product or service that really delights their end customer, I, if they stay focused on that, then, um, if, if you basically if, if if you get it such that your customers want you to mm. succeed, mm. then then you probably will. Right, uh, you have to focus on the customer and delivering for them. Yeah, make yeah. sure if your customers love you, you will, your odds of success are dramatically higher. Yeah. All the entrepreneurs in this in this room, they're they're listening to that message, and you know we're running out of time, so this is the final question. Um, this is for the budding entrepreneurs in the room who could take an Elon Musk idea and run with it. I mean, quite famously, Hyperloop was the idea that you had to give away because you just don't have enough time to, to deal with it. What, what are the other ideas that you have that you would love to see another entrepreneur just take on and, and go? Well, I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in, in general in electrification of transport, so um, electric aircraft. I mm -hmm. think there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, I think um, in in genetics, although it's, it's, that's sort of a thorny area, but I think that's in terms of solving some of the more um, intransigent, intransigent diseases, genetics are really key to, to solving those. Mm. Um, something that I think people may be um, only beginning to look at uh, is establishing some kind of uh, brain-computer interface. Um, so a brain-computer in interface. Yeah, at, at the at the neuron level. Um, so this is sort of intellig in, 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 um, uh, intelligence augmentation as opposed to artificial intelligence. Right. Um, and I think that, that, is, that has a lot of potential. Um, you mentioned to me this to me yesterday. I really had kind of no idea what you were talking about. And then I looked up Ian Banks, mm -hmm. Neural Lace. Neural Lace. That's right. Exactly. And so it's this concept of you know, wiring the brain. So it's either we could, there, there could be a brain internet. And it could also mean that we can upload our thoughts to the cloud. You, you would never forget anything. <laughs> you, and you wouldn't need to take photographs. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's incredible. I mean, it's, you, you would never forget anything. You would expand um, your, your ability to, to process information, to remember information, right? Um, but and, then, and but then when the denial of service attack happens, <laughs> <laughs> you, you gotta watch out for hacking. That could really right, be you awkward. Watch out for yeah. that. Um, but but also, and then I read it can also be used to fight degenerative diseases like Parkinson's too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I think it actually would be quite um, quite an equalizer as well, because I think the, the the delta between uh, you know it, it, like it would it would sort of even things out. I think. You mean in humankind, yeah, people yeah. would be there would be no um, education disadvantage. Everyone would yeah. be starting at the same level. Yeah. So there would be no meritocracy. No, there would be there new would be, meritocracy. There would You'd be, but it would be, the, the differences would be smaller. Um, the delta would be smaller, probably. Wow, and yeah. you really welcome that kind of world. All right, welcome. The, you asked for predictions. Okay, um, <laughs> for Predictions sorry. are not the same as right. preferences. Um, so, I mean, do I think something like that is likely to occur? I think pro probably. Wow. 
Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Um, we could go on and on. Unfortunately, we have to wrap and leave it at that. Let's uh, let's give it up for Elon Musk. That was really awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christy uh, from CNN and the de facto game changer, Elon Musk. If I can invite you to both stay on stage for a moment, we're going to do a group photo. I'd like to please invite to join us on stage Mr. Greg So, Hong Kong's Secretary for the Commerce and Economic Development, along with all our distinguished speakers and our vertical champions, as well as our venue partner for the Start Me Up HK Festival. Come on up on stage, we're gonna take a group photo together. I believe we're gonna move the furniture briefly. Can I also please just make sure that we include these individuals, Matt Dooley, Renu Bhatia, Anson Bailey. Irene Chu, Andy Liu, Steve Monahan, Angie Ung, and the Brink team, Mickey, Christina, and Manav. We'll have to get in nice and close with each other. Wow. 